know, what's interesting is sometimes as a pastor you have to catch yourself. And the reason being is because I was singing there and I, then I had to remember, I have to have a voice after this is done. I was singing and I'm, I'm getting hoarse because I'm singing. But God is an amazing God, is he not? Praise the Lord. I want to ask you a question this morning. Who wants to see a miracle? If I said to you, would you like to see a miracle? How many people would not like to see a miracle? Now, I'm not going to perform a miracle. I'm not God. But you know, I was sitting in a Bible study one time, and as we were sitting there, he asked me the question, this gentleman that I had been studying with, he says, have you ever seen a miracle? And I said, yeah, I believe I have. He goes, well, he goes, I, I've, I, I've studied the word, I, I've looked at what God says, I believe that God exists, but I've never seen anything that I would consider to be a miracle. He goes, so when you say you've seen a miracle, how would you describe what you've seen? And I said to him, I have seen God work in ways that are completely impossible. Let me give you a for instance. I remember back in Hurricane Katrina. Anybody remember Hurricane Katrina? How it devastated the Gulf Coast, Mississippi, uh, Texas, those areas. And, and I remember we were working at the Red Cross first aid uh, station, and we were cooking. Now, I, I have to tell you, if you've ever cooked for a large group of people, it is very different than cooking for a small family. When we made spaghetti, we made spaghetti for a lot of people. And so it was, it was just devastated the area that we were working in. And I remember one night... As we were preparing the food, they said, we have a truck coming in with the rest of the food that you're going to need for this evening. Because at the time, we had 2,500 people already lined up to get their dinner. And we only had about half the food that we need. And so as we're cooking and as we're getting things ready, we get a phone call that the truck had been stolen. And so that we were going to have to work with what we had there. And so we had roughly enough food for a thousand people. We had 2,500 in line. And so we got together as a group and we prayed because we didn't know what we were going to do. last cup of food when the last person went through the end of the line. I can't explain it. I don't even try. I can only say that it was a God thing. Another example I think of a miracle that I've seen in my life is I was working with a group of young people who were doing just random acts of kindness. And, you know, there are certain teenagers that follow the rules and do what they're supposed to do. Then there are those who don't. I was one of them, okay? But at the top, as a leader, you get to understand that there are certain children or certain teenagers that you want more than others. Because you know they're going to do something. But you also know that you have certain kids that they wouldn't do anything wrong if you paid them to. And so you don't worry about them. And so I remember going to this gas station. And as I was going to this gas station, we were just finishing up. We were getting back to the church, but we were almost out of gas. And, then, you know, if you return the bus back without any gas, they yell at you and, you know, all kinds of things. So we stopped to get gas. And so this young lady, who again always followed the rules, always did what she was told. We told everybody, we're not, getting, we're not getting snacks, we're not doing anything, because we've got to get back to church on time. We're just getting gas. 
and then we're going to get back to the church. And I'm pumping the gas, and the kids are in the van, and as we're sitting there, all of a sudden I see this young woman get out of the, uh, get out of the van and start walking away. And like, at first you go through the roll call to the ones that you know that would do something like that, and I'm like, that's not, it's not so-and-so, it's not so-and-so, there they are, they're in the van, they're, they're good, they're good. Who is that? So I, I, I walked over there, and I'm, I'm walking from the end of the van, and here's one of my kids who would never do anything wrong, just walking away from the van after we told him not to, and I'm like, what's going on? And she talks to this man that was pumping his gas, and all of a sudden, she's talking to him, and and I'm watching his tears begin to run down his face. And for some reason, I could tell at that moment it was a God thing. I didn't know what I was walking into, but I walked over. And literally what she had said to him was, Jesus loves you, so go talk to that guy. What we didn't know was he was going home to shoot himself. But in his mind, he was so stupid that he forgot to put gas in the car to get him home to shoot himself. Never did he know that God was, he was literally at the pump saying to God, if you love me, tell me so right now. And then we got back to church and I, we prayed and that young man gave his life to the Lord right there in a gas station on his knees with the three of us. Right there. I got back to church and I sat down with that young lady just to kind of debrief as to what had just occurred. And I said, what, what, what? She said, God told me to get out of the car and go talk to that person. So I did. Another miracle that I've seen is I have seen people who science says should not be here. I've seen it with members of this church who they've been told they're brain dead. There's nothing left that can be done. This last year, I saw it with my own father. I was told that you have 24 hours before your father will die. He was here a week ago to see his granddaughter. Miracles happen all the time. However, our new vision as we talk about connect, grow, serve, and go. This month's focus is You know, as a kid, I was that kid that you could tell me something, and I could know that it was right. However, I wanted to know why. That drove me more insane than anything else, because my, my dad and my dad response to me at a certain point was, because I said so. He would answer my questions until I got to the point where the answer was, because I said so. But sometimes I believe that the answer to the question why sometimes is even more important than what we do. So I can something and not know why I do it. We do it all the time. You know, I was joking with somebody yesterday. I told somebody one day that I would never become my father. I remember I remember my dad going through the house, shutting the lights off, and what am I going to run all the city and you know, shut the lights off and come on and he flipped through the house and then the other day I caught myself. What is this? Grand Central Station, and I'm going through the house flipping the lights off. And I stopped and I realized I had become my father. So what did I do? I went and I flipped on every light in the house just to prove that I wasn't. But, but, but here's what was, here's why I present, because I think the why behind the reason for serving is important. Now, there's many different reasons. There's also, there's many answers to this question of why. 
But today, because this is Communion Sabbath, it's going to be a one-point sermon. So if you miss my point, you're in trouble. It's a one-point sermon. And here is that point. The point is, the reason why we serve is because we get to see God work. Let me say that again. It's a one-point sermon. you got to catch this one point. The reason why we serve is because we get to see God work. I ask the question, how many of you would like to see a miracle? If you want to see a miracle happen, then you need to walk and talk with Jesus daily. Because there was something about Jesus. When you walk and talk with Jesus daily, you were bound to see a miracle happen. You know, there are people that followed Jesus just to see what was going on. There's a lot of people that like to see things. I read a quote last night, and I wish I know who said it, because I'd love to give them credit, but I, I will tell you it's not my quote. That's all I can tell you. It said, there are willing people in every church. There are some that are willing to work. There are some that are willing to work. Let me say that again. There are willing people in every church. There are some that are willing to work, and there are some that are willing to let them. So here's the thing. The times that I have seen miracles in my life is the time where I'm walking as close to God as I possibly can. I want to prove this point. If you have your Bible with you, open it to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Starting in verse 1. Jesus is here at a wedding. This is probably described as Jesus' first miracle. Normally, we talk about, we talk about this story of this parent, this this story of Jesus as being from the perspective of Jesus or being as from the perspective of those at the wedding. But there's another group of people here that we don't normally talk about. And that is those who were serving. How many of you have ever been a waiter or waitress in your life? Raise your hand. I am a firm believer that every person should work a service industry job at some point in their life. It changes the way you view people. It changes the way that you view people. It changes the way that you look at the common people. And, and you know what's amazing was my server was the worst job I've ever had in my life. Let me say that again. You can literally be standing in front of somebody, talking to them, and they don't know you're there. It's possible for people to do the thing. You may not see them, but they definitely see you. I have seen and heard some things that are crazy working as a waiter. So here in the story, there's a unique group of people that we don't really talk about. It's those who are serving at the wedding. Because when we talk about a wedding, we normally talk about the bride. We talk about the groom. We talk about the guests. But we don't talk about the people serving at the wedding. So let's read. John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. 
So that's a pretty amazing wedding if Jesus shows up for your wedding. Amen? I wouldn't mind having him as a guest at my wedding. It says, when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? Now, I have to make something clear. The quickest way to end up on the couch is to start a sentence to your wife or your mother with, woman. That is the quickest way I know to end up on the couch. But this wasn't a term of disrespect, okay? we got to make this clear. The way that he was, it was a loving tone that he was talking to his mother. It was a response because if you have a mother that I have, I said, I was Jesus, there would have been a sandal that went off, and she would have shared some blessings with me. And so he says this, and it says, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to do, says to you, do it. Anybody ever have a mother that's never listened to them? Even if you tell them something, they're going to do what they're going to do. I think that's in the mother handbook. Okay. So Jesus says, what does your concern have to do with me? My time hasn't come yet. And there he goes, just do, tells the servants, just do whatever he tells you to do. And what does Jesus do? He honors his mother. Now, when there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, of containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece, that's a lot of wine, 180 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. Who was the master of the feast? Master of the feast was basically the master of ceremonies. It was the honored guest. It was the MC. And he said, so take this water and draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it, and when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from. Catch this next, ses next section. But the servants who had drawn the water knew. Anybody ever catch that before? So when they took the wine to the master of the feast, he tasted it, and he started talking about how great it was, how incredible it was, how unbelievable it was, and he couldn't figure out where this came from. But yet those who were serving knew where that wine came from. You know, here's the thing about service. Sometimes the people that we are serving do not know what is happening to them. They get to experience the blessings of Jesus Christ, but they had no idea. Nobody walked out to the party and said, hey, this is the wine that Jesus turned from water to wine. And they just began serving this wine to the people, and the people enjoyed it. You know, it's amazing to me that sometimes we forget that people can experience Jesus Christ and not really truly even know what they're experiencing. Just like the guests at this wedding, they didn't know what was happening. But 
those who were serving the wine knew exactly what was and I guarantee you, every ladle that was coming out of those buckets, somebody was sitting there going, I can't believe this. Do you see what is happening here? When we choose to serve, we get to see God work. We get to see the behind the scenes. We get to see what God is doing. I guarantee you that there wasn't a servant then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum. He, his mother, his brothers, his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. We have the privilege of sharing the very best of Jesus Christ with everyone. So like the master at this feast, he, he, he tasted this experience, and he said, you, you've saved the best for last. That doesn't even make any sense because in those days at the wedding, they would give the best wine first. This is, this is you're, you're giving it last. It just doesn't make any sense. Why would you do this? And they were able to explain what Jesus had done for them. Does anybody see any similarities here? The fact that Jesus Christ did something amazing. They had served the people until they asked the question, why? And they had to explain that it was none other than Jesus Christ who had done it for them. Sound like a sermon we've had before? Sound similar to something we talked about? When it comes to service, we have the privilege to see God work in ways he has never worked before. I remember that same young man that I talked about earlier who said to me, I want to see a miracle. One Sabbath after church, we had had an appeal and we had 13 people come and give their life to the Lord. That same day, that young man by the name of Peter came to me and he said, Peter, I have a miracle here. Same young man that says, I want to see a miracle. And I said, okay, you've got to share it with me. What did you see? He said, I saw God speak to my mother. He said, I saw God have my mother call me this morning at 8 a.m. and say, I want to go to church with you today. He said, I saw my mother sit through a service and saw my mother convicted by the Spirit. He said, then I saw my mother stand up and call Jesus Christ. He goes, I have seen a miracle in this place today. Because if you had asked me if that would ever happen, he said there was no way, no chance, no how. But with Jesus, anything is possible. When we talk about communion, what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It's an opportunity for us to have a brand new start. Sometimes we have issues. Sometimes we have problems. Sometimes we have things that are separating us from God. In the Adventist church, we believe that baptism is once a decision that we make for the rest of our lives. But at communion, we have an opportunity to start fresh with God. It's an opportunity to set our hearts and our minds right 
with Him. Maybe it's your heart's desire to have a closer walk with Jesus. Maybe you want to see that miracle happen in your life. Maybe you've never seen God work in such a powerful way. What if today you decided to renew your relationship with Him? To start fresh in that walk with Jesus Christ. To pray daily that God will do a miracle through you serving other people. And trust me, if you're faithful to God, I can say without any hesitation that I know that God will be faithful to you. I want God to do a miracle for you. Sometimes I think that we fall short of the blessing that God wants to give to us because we're not willing to believe that God will actually give it to us. Where are you in your walk? Are you walking with Jesus? Do you want to continue walking and moving forward and asking God to grow you in ways that you've never grown before? Make that decision today as we have communion. Maybe you've wandered away, but now need to come back. Make that decision. Don't let it stop with just, oh, that was a great sermon. You know what? I can give the best sermon in the world, but if it doesn't go to your heart and to your mind, and if it doesn't cause you to connect deeper with God, it doesn't mean a thing. It's just information. Finally, may you never accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Please do not walk out of this building without doing that. Because it's the best decision you can ever make. We want you to be part of our family. We can make that happen in terms of Bible studies, baptism, whatever the case may be. But don't leave this place without knowing who Jesus is. And even if you have to have somebody explain it to you, I've got somebody who will sit here and explain it to you until tomorrow if it needs be. In church, we practice what's considered open communion. And what that means is we believe that anyone who chooses Jesus as their personal Savior is welcome to participate. You don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to be a Seventh-day Adventist. All you need to understand is that you love Jesus and that he's Lord of your life. As for children, we leave that of our parents. If you would like your children to participate, they are welcome to do that. If the, you would like them not to participate, that is completely up to you. And again, this is the time to renew our relationship. So at this time, we're going to separate for our foot washing. For those of you who don't know what that is, we follow what's called the Ordinance of Humility, which is the way that Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. If you'd like to participate, you're more than welcome to. The women will be across the hall in the fellowship hall. The couples will be to my left in the juniors room, the men in the teens room, and there will be overflow here in the front of the church here. If not, you're welcome to stay where you are in your seats and remain here in the sanctuary until we come back for time for communion. So at this time, we will separate.